Welcome to Biology 2402 Lecture Series, Chapter 27, Fluid, Electrolyte, and Acid-Base Balance. Now, unlike the other chapters we have done so far, this is a summary chapter. This chapter involves fluid balance, such as Biology 2401 on extracellular fluid, intracellular fluid, dealing with acid-base balance for the respiratory chapter, the digestive chapter, and electrolytes, which is something was mentioned in the bone chapter and such. So on this chapter, unlike the other chapters, there are certain slides and flow charts you must understand. I will be going through the slides as I usually do, but some of them are far more important than others. Starting with our first slide, which is this one. Now, you should already know much of this information. Water. Water is 99% of the fluid outside the cell. And you've learned that when we were in the blood chapter, because blood, the plasma portion, what was the number one ingredient in the plasma portion of our blood? Water. Remember, it accounted for a big chunk. So that's exactly what we're getting at. We're going to take many of our former chapters and put them together in this chapter. You already know by now that all cell operations rely on water. So you learned that in Biology 2401 in terms of water playing a role in lubrication, playing a role as a medium for gases, nutrients, and wastes. So you see that this chapter is a summary. Next slide. We already know that we have extracellular fluid and intracellular fluid, and we must maintain a normal composition in both. So both of these must have the right stuff in them. Next slide. Now, I'm not going to read all of this, but we already know that for fluid balance, we're talking about fluid homeostasis. We have water gained and water lost. And that's where our urinary chapter comes into play. You have to have the right amount of fluid in your body. You cannot have too much fluid because it's going to create an osmotic issue. And you can't have too little fluid because that too will create an osmotic problem. So you can't be dehydrated as well as you can't be over flooded either. Now remember we said in the cardiovascular that we don't want what? We never want pooling of fluid in our body. That word edema comes into play. So we have to have the right amount of water gain and the right amount of water loss. As you can see, there is a common theme among all the slides we're going to see in chapter 27. And that is, digestive system will allow us to gain the water. So if you're dehydrated, what's the only way you're going to get water into your body? By drinking it. How are we going to lose water? Well, primarily you're going to lose water through the urine system, through your pee, through your urine. Okay. Next slide. So our name of the game is to have the right electrolyte balance, and that comes from having the right water balance. Now, why does water and electrolyte go hand in hand? Well, electrolyte balance and water balance goes together because electrolytes pull the water. So if you, have the right, if you have the right salt content, and when I mean salt, I'm talking about ion content, electrolyte content, you're going to have the right water content as well. Now electrolytes play a very important role in electricity, right? That electrical circuitry, that sodium depolarization, potassium repolarization, so you know that electrolytes play a very important role. By now, you've learned that if you don't have the right amount of calcium in your body, you're going to have a problem with your heart. So you see that you have to have the right balance. And of course, the digestive system and the urinary system will play a role in that water and electrolyte balance. So again, if you haven't learned this yet, make a note of this. Even sweat. Right? Sweat deals with water, but it also deals with electrolytes. So someone who excessively sweats a lot is also losing electrolytes, maybe vital to them. OK, 
lubricant. So you can't sweat it off, you can't urinate it out, and you can't also defecate it out either. So if you have excessive diarrhea, excessive diarrhea is not only a water loss issue, but excessive diarrhea is also an electrolyte issue. Ask anyone who has had malaria. I had malaria. And as a malaria patient, I can tell you that not only are you losing weight and losing fluids through your digestive tract, but you're also losing electrolytes. So you see, it does play a role. So remember, electrolytes and water balance go together. Very, very important. Next slide, pH. I am not going to go into all the nitty gritty about pH because you should already know that pH is related to the balance of your hydrogen ions. So that's an important statement to get off right now, that it's a balance of your hydrogen ions. Now what's the opposite? The opposite of our hydrogen ions is our bicarbonate ion. Now, Nemish, are you trying to refer back to our bicarbonate buffer system, which accounts for the big chunk of how we deal with CO2 in our blood? That's exactly right. So yes, we are intertwining chapters, as I've mentioned over and over. So now, wait a second, Nemish, pH, does that also deal with the digestive system as well? Because then you mentioned a lot of pH stuff about stomach acid and all that and neutralizing it and the hormone secretin playing a role in the neutralization by releasing, secreting bicarbonate ions into the GI tract. Exactly. So we're monitoring the pH of our chyme. We're monitoring the pH of our blood, the production of HCl in the stomach. All of that is done by the acid-base balance. And every one of the things I just mentioned came from different chapters. Now, whoa, there it is. See what I'm getting at. The kidneys. Yes, the kidneys will do what? Secrete hydrogen ions, especially where? In the trailing end of our nephron. It's mentioned here too, so if you didn't get it from that chapter, you can get it again. In the trailing end, our DCT, our collecting duct. Our trailing end of our nephron deals with the buffering of our blood, but by either adding or subtracting from the filtrate. If I add to the filtrate, we call it secretion. If I remove from the filtrate, we called it reabsorption. So we're either adding or removing from the filtrate, which is also saying that we are either adding or subtracting from the blood. So we can actually regulate the pH of our blood by regulating the pH of our filtrate. That's exactly right. We are removing from one, adding to the other. The lungs will do the same thing with our carbon dioxide. We can lower our blood pH by raising carbon dioxide in our blood. So if someone holds their breath, they're actually going to do what? Raise their carbon dioxide level, which lowers their pH and makes their blood acidic. But if the lungs is able to eliminate the carbon dioxide, we'll actually raise our blood pH as we eliminate the carbon dioxide. So see how that works. Next, fluid in the body. Okay. And as we said, water is a big deal. Next slide. Water exchange. I'm not going to say anything more than what's on that slide. Water is affected by osmosis, by diffusion, and by carrier-mediated transport, such as active transport stuff, such as movement of solids from one side to the other. So all of this. And remember how we created osmosis in the urinary chapter? We created osmosis by the active transport of sodium. So moving ions can create an osmotic gradient. Next slide. Okay, this slide I don't care too much about. This is simply letting you know that we have different chambers. So blood 
fluid is a chamber, lymph is a chamber. These are different body regions. Cerebrospinal fluid, which is in the brain from Biology 2401, that is a chamber containing fluids. So anytime you have a compartment of fluid, that's a, a compartment, a chamber. Next, we know that our capillaries are unique. Right? We have capillaries that have fenestrated capillaries. We have different kinds of capillaries that allow fluids to drain. So our relationship becomes relationship between blood, relationship between the extracellular fluid, and the relationship between the cell. And I'm sure your, your instructors in the past have shown a blood vessel with extracellular fluid around it and a cell with intracellular fluid in it. So again, we see a three area, one, two, three area relationship. We already know that we have proteins in our body, lipids in our body, carbohydrates, minerals, and so on. Okay. Next slide. We already know that plasma, most of plasma, is water. We also know the fluid around the cell, which is interstitial fluid, but some people even call it extracellular fluid. As a matter of fact, it's listed here. So we see that water is pretty much everywhere. Next slide. Okay. Our relationship wheel, just be aware of it. I don't care too much about it. Next slide, same thing. Okay. We've already seen this in a picture form, so we can pass that up. I've already mentioned the word compartments a moment ago. And I already talked about the word active transport ago. Okay. Now, this bottom portion is very important. By now, if you have not seen this in general biology, you have not seen this in biology 2401 for some reason, you definitely need to know this. And I'm pretty sure that when you learned depolarization, repolarization, cell membrane potential, you did see this. So this bottom part, extracellular fluid has sodium chloride bicarbonates for the most part. Intracellular fluid has potassium, magnesium, phosphate, and a whole lot of negatively charged proteins. It is this reason why the cell membrane is slightly negative on the inside. So why it's slightly negative on the inside is because of the negatively charged proteins. Okay, this is something that is in picture form of what we just wrote. So this is a picture version of the bottom part that I just went over. Next slide. Same thing, don't care too much about that. Next slide. Now, we already know about membranes. That's why a moment ago I told you that membranes are a very important role. Inside is slightly negative in comparison to the outside. We already know that cell membranes are selectively permeable. You learned that in Biology 2401 and you've been using it all along. It's selective permeable to size, charge, lipid solubility, and presence of a carrier or transport. So that's why it's selective. It needs a special carrier, transporter, size, charge, and lipid solubility. We already know that certain ions can go in, certain ions can go out based upon their carrier. So that's something we've already learned. Next slide. No big deal. I've already told you that we have osmosis because of the differences in the ion concentration. Next slide. Okay, this slide is important. Matter of fact, you can see that the print is slightly italicized. Print. This slide is important. You've already learned it. They have just summed it up on a slide for you. Such as, cells cannot move water molecules by themselves. Okay. 
They cannot. You have to create an osmotic gradient. Okay. So you have to have a channel. Okay. You have to have a channel. You have to have an osmotic gradient created. Okay. That's what this is. Okay, next slide. So this one's a important basic concept to keep in mind. So you're moving water by creating an osmotic gradient through the active transport of ions. Next slide. You've already come across all of these. Again, now from this slide, you can clearly tell that we are using the stuff we've learned before. So antidiuretic hormone, aldosterone, and the natriuretic peptide of the heart. The A and P of the heart. Next slide. We already know what ADH does, so I'm not going to go into that. So we already know what ADH does. Okay. We know how ADH operates, especially where? In the collecting duct especially in the collecting duct. We know that ADH comes from the posterior pituitary, that type of thing. So all this we already know. Okay, next slide. Aldosterone. We know that aldosterone is part of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone story. We know that it deals with the sodium levels. So when we have a decrease in sodium levels in the blood, aldosterone will kick in from the adrenal cortex and do their thing. So we already know that. And I already mentioned collecting duct before. It's mentioned again as well. Collecting duct and distal convoluted tubule. So it is now maintaining the ratio between sodium and potassium. Next slide. Now, You've seen me say this, now the author has said it too. Water follows salt. So water follows salt. So aldosterone's job is to pull the salt, and as you pull the salt, water will follow because you've created an osmotic gradient. Next slide. A and P, we've already talked about this as well. So that's previously discussed. Again, in, these, in this chapter, chapter 27, go through the slides and the templates. You're going to see that we've already talked about it, we've learned it, and now all this chapter is doing is making sure you've got it down as a different chapter system. Next slide. Okay, water movement and electrolytes. You've heard me say this already. Look what it says here. When the body loses electrolytes, water is lost by osmosis. Can't get any plainer than that. So wherever the electrolytes will go, there is going to be an osmotic pull. So when the body loses electrolytes, water is lost by osmosis. Okay. Very, very important. Next slide. Again, I'll let you look at this one. Remember it says no large scale movement between ECF and ICF. You shouldn't. That would cause a big massive disturbance. So you never want big changes between ECF and ICF. Matter of fact, when you have these big changes between the ECF and ICF, that's where you're going to have problems. Next slide. We've already talked about this, the net hydrostatic pressure. Now you already know that the net Hydrostatic pressure is related to net filtration pressure. So the kidneys are involved in this story. We already know about net colloidal osmotic pressure. So as you can see, colloidal pressure is going to pull it into where? Plasma. So the net colloidal osmotic pressure will keep fluids in the plasma. Net hydrostatic pressure Net hydrostatic pressure will move fluids out of the blood and into the interstitial space. These are opposites of each other. So these are opposites. This gets blood or fluids rather out of the blood 
and this keeps fluid in the blood. So one more time. Hydrostatic pressure will get fluids out of the blood, and colloidal pressure will keep the fluids in the blood. Next slide. Okay, this one I don't really care too much about. We already know that there is a relationship between the lymphatic system and the venous system. Remember the subclavian vein? Okay, so this is a nice little slide letting you know that the lymphatic system is related to the circulatory system, the venous system. Okay, next, edema. We've already talked about that. Now, Nemesh, what was the other word you used for edema today, just a second ago? Edema goes with pooling. So we never want pooling anywhere in the body. So if you have an increased blood flow to an area and you're creating edema, you need to stop that. If it means clamping off a blood vessel, if it means somehow putting ice on the injury to curb the flow to that injury so the swelling does not increase, that is all related to this. Next slide. Okay, fluid. Okay. So fluid. Remember, you can't afford to lose fluid. So fluid loss. If you ever seen a rabbit, I used to have a rabbit as a pet. And a rabbit has very, very dry pellet poops. Why? Because as a rabbit, it's small body size, it cannot afford to lose volume of fluid equal to its body weight. Okay. An elephant, go collect a big pail and take it to the zoo and you can see that an elephant is going to urinate out a lot of fluid out of his body because it can afford it. It's a much bigger animal. So in terms of body weight, there's only so much fluid you can lose. So if you look around the animal kingdom, the bigger the animal, the more fluid it can afford to lose. If a rabbit were to pee out how much we pee out or poop out in terms of fluid loss through our normal fluid loss through our poop, it couldn't survive. Okay. So water loss is a very important issue. Next, water gain. Well, you gain water from your mouth. You either drink it or you eat it. Okay. So we have water going into our bodies by either eating it or drinking it. Okay. Next, this is just a picture version. I would strongly keep pictures in mind. And I believe this is the second or third main picture so far. So to me, pictures are a thousand words. So this is one to keep in mind. So you want to have a nice little balance among all of these. Next slide. I don't care for the numbers here, so we can pass up this slide. So yes, water is generated. You've already learned this in general biology, oxidative phosphorylation, and it made water using hydrogen and oxygen. And if you recall, oxygen was the final electron acceptor and it formed water. Well, that's exactly what this is relating to. So the more metabolic you are, you are going to generate your own water. Not enough to survive, but you are producing water within the cells. Next, fluid shift. Now, this is exactly what you do with your bank accounts. Okay, this is exactly what you do with your bank accounts. If you got very little money in your checking account, you got more money in your saving account and you need to start writing checks because you need to start paying off people, what are you going to do? You're going to move your money from your saving account and put it into your checking account from which you can write a check. You're going to shift funds. That's exactly what this story is about on this slide where we're now shifting water. We're moving water based upon the needs. 
Now, yes, Nemesh, you said a moment ago that extracellular fluid and intracellular fluid should be relatively balanced. That's true. But you know what you do at home to still stay above water. Don't you take things out of savings and put them into checking? Or if you got a lot of checking account money and you know that you need to earn a better interest rate, what do you do? You put it into your savings account because you know that you're not going to be spending a lot for a while. That's exactly what this is like. In this case, you are actually moving fluids around. Fluid is a currency to the body. Okay? Very, very important. Make sure you study this slide. We've already learned about hypertonic, hypotonic already. Next slide. No big deal. Remember, intercellular fluid acts as a water reservoir. You want to keep some water in the cell because it's necessary for cell function, for chemical reactions. Remember that from long ago, from Biology 2401, you had hydrolysis, you had dehydration reactions, that's why. Next, allocation for water loss, okay. dehydration. The last slide I showed you, about the banking thing, that's exactly what we're doing here. Look what it says. If water is lost, but electrolytes must be retained. So our object of the game is to minimize the water loss, but still retain some electrolytes. So we have to be very careful. That's dehydration story. Severe water loss. This by now should make sense to you. Now why is this slide going to be important? What do you think we do as instructors? We give scenarios. Earlier I mentioned excessive sweating. So just a little while ago I mentioned excessive sweating. That's water loss. Inadequate water uh, consumption. If you're not drinking enough water, you're going to have a problem. Vomiting, if you throw up a lot, so if you repeatedly vomit, or if you have diarrhea. I mentioned a while ago that I had malaria. Well, that's a heavy diarrhea situation there. And when I had malaria, I had a lot of water loss, and I had to make sure my body could accommodate. So these are the things that my body is going to try to do. Increase fluid intake and prevent as much water loss by reabsorption as possible. So, of course, water loss is going to lead to what? Electrolyte imbalance. That's why when you're an athlete and you're dehydrated on the field, not only are you losing water, but you're using, losing electrolytes. So what do you do? You take Gatorade. It provides the sugar, provides the electrolytes, provides the water. Okay. So that's what we're doing. When you have an accident victim, the first thing they do is start an IV line so that since the patient can't drink, you got to feed them with their IV. So the IV setup is the, the most important thing. Water balance is important because if you have the right water balance, the electrolyte balance can be fixed. Next line. Okay, how do I move my water gain? I need to move my water gain this way occurs when excessive water shifts. Yes, you're going to distort the cells. You may even pop them. Okay. So you want to make sure that you have the right amount of water gain. And of course, to adjust the water gain, you're going to adjust the electrolytes as well. Okay, to continue. Now, remember, we cannot afford to have water accumulate in the body and not have the electrolytes to be adjusted as well. If you cannot adjust electrolytes to water, so the ratio between them, here's what happens. The inability to eliminate excess water is going to cause heart failure, cirrhosis, and even chronic kidney failure. So you see, having a lot of water is just as bad as not having enough. So when we have rains in Houston, if the ground has not been able to soak up the water and, you, and it rains more and more, we're going to get flooding. 
if we have rain and the ground absorbs everything and quickly and there's not enough rain, you're going to have cracks in the ground and you're going to have your plants die. So you see, water is good coming in and water is good leaving, but you can't afford too much loss and you cannot also afford too much coming in without balancing out the electrolytes. Next slide. Now having said that, look what it says right here. What do you see on this slide? Signs of overhydration, abnormally low sodium concentrations, effects on CNS, water intoxication. Now it's a rarity, but it can happen. You can cause your brain to malfunction by having taking in too much water. There have been reported cases of where people have died because they drank too much water all at once. It's got to be very severe. Now, having said that, next slide. You can study this if you want. This is simply letting you know how you're maintaining the balance between them. So the object of the game is to adjust the water and adjust the electrolytes as well. Now, what I have been saying for the last few slides is exactly what it says here. Now let's read this one together because this sums up what I've been saying. Electrolyte balance requires rates of gain and loss of each electrolyte in the body to be equal. You can't have too much sodium going in one place and potassium not budget. The sodium potassium balance and the sodium and other ion balances have to be maintained. This is very much a seesaw act or a seesaw effect. You have to have everything in balance. Um, the movie Karate Kid says it best. Mr. Miyagi said, go find balance because you have to have all your electrolytes in balance. Look what the next portion says. Electrolyte concentration directly affects water balance. Now you should definitely get that down because we've said it too many times. Electrolyte concentration affects water balance and likewise water balance affects electrolytes. Next slide. So you know that we can't have just sodium flying around without having some kind of other salts being affected too. So here's sodium. Don't care for that slide. Right. This one, I don't care for the number. But if you recall earlier, I mentioned a slide. It is worthwhile going back to that right now. So this is the slide. Let me go hunt for it that I said was very important, this one. So this slide is very important to keep in mind. More wear, more wear. So I have more sodium in the extracellular fluid, less in intracellular. I have more potassium in the intracellular, less in extracellular. That balance is important to keep in mind. Okay. So that's what this is saying. Next slide. Potassium has that same kind of story. Notice I have more where? More potassium inside the cell. And it says it right there too. So stuff we've learned is coming back. Okay, this slide is very important. Most common problems with electrolyte balance are caused by imbalance between gains and loss of sodium ions. That is why we keep talking about the depolarization in the nervous system issue. It's always pretty much a gain or loss with sodium. There are some issues with potassium, but more dangerous with sodium. Okay, next slide. Okay. Okay. So sodium balance. Now, I don't care for this slide, but I want to show you something. Sodium intake through digestion. Sodium output by way of urine chapter and sweating. 
So there's only one good way in and a couple of good ways out of your body, normally. Next slide. Don't care for that. Okay. This slide we've already talked about. Don't really care for that. Okay. Now, this slide is something we've already learned. It says, corrected by homeostatic mechanisms that regulate blood pressure and blood volume. So this is where you have stories like ADH, aldosterone, then epinephrine. So yes, different chapters, even biology 2401 will play a role with this. So blood volume, blood pressure. And notice, if ECF volume rises, blood volume goes up. If ECF, ECF volume drops, blood volume goes down, because that's where it's coming from. Okay, so hydrostatic pressure from your blood, all that plays a role here. Now I'm going to have slides coming up in a moment, and the slides are relating to the pictures on page 1007. Page 1007. Here's your first picture. So make sure you study this picture on page 1007. I'm not going over it because we've already learned this skill before. Okay, then we have the bottom picture on page 1007. What happens when we go the other way? Next slide. Now, of course, when we talk about homeostatic mechanisms, I see everything we've learned before. Wait a second, Nemish. Blood pressure, blood pressure, carotid sinus, aortic sinus, right atrium, baroreceptors. That's right. The baroreceptors, chemoreceptors, proprioreceptors that we learned before in Biology 2401 and in the heart chapter in biology 2402, they're coming back. So we're always monitoring blood pressure this way. Next slide. I care for the term, so the term is important. So hyponatremia, hypernatremia, the terms are important. So on this slide, terms are important. This we've all already learned. It's worthwhile going over it again. Next slide. So if your blood volume drops, the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone story will kick in. Okay. Venous return. If you got too much fluid Plasma volume is too large. Remember, you don't want pooling anywhere. So if you got too much blood volume going around, the venous returns got to increase as well. Because remember, you don't want fluids pooling anywhere. Now, what story does this go with that you've learned in the heart chapter? The Frank Starling Law. I don't see that here, Nemish, but that's exactly what this is relating to. If you are pumping more fluids out of your heart, you're also going to have to do what? Bring fluids back to the heart. And remember, that was the Frank Starling's law. What goes out must come back. So that's what this is. And if you have too much fluid, eventually you're going to have to do what? Elim eliminate it. Get rid of it by way of the salt and the water by way of kidney. Next slide, again a picture. This is now page 1008. So you have 1007 and 1008 to look at. That's the top picture. That's the bottom picture. Now, you may not have, have had exactly the same picture before in their respective former chapters. So you may not have had the same picture, but you did have the same content, the same information before. So not necessarily the same picture, but the same content before. Next slide. 
potassium balance. Again, same story. You take it in by digestion and you lose it by urinary. So that's what this is about. Next slide. Same way again. Now these you actually did see. You can actually adjust this by way of your urinary system. So it's mentioned right here in the urinary system. And we did see a picture on that one. Okay. Next slide. Let me back up for a second. Make sure you study this part right here. Okay. Next slide. This one we've already talked about. Next slide. Okay, to continue, I'm now on this slide. Now, before I go forward on this slide, there's an error, a typo in the book. I'm on page 1008. So on page 1008, at the bottom of the page, you see this picture. The typo is actually right here where I'm highlighting it. That should read hyperkalemia. So this slide, this portion here should read hyperkalemia. Now let's go over the orange part. When you have hyperkalemia, then you have an increase in your potassium levels within your extracellular fluid. Now the reason why I'm bringing out only the orange side for hyperkalemia, that is what Dr. Kevorkian, the suicide doctor, helping the terminally ill commit euthanasia. And that's what he would do. He would inject them with high concentrations of potassium and would, that would cause severe cardiac arrhythmia. So I'm letting you know this slide is very important. So the regulation of sodium that we saw before, and now the regulation of potassium is important. Next slide. So this is a summary of what we have said. So we have hypernatremia, hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, and hypokalemia. This slide is worthwhile. It's important. Next slide comes with calcium. Now you already know by now that calcium is primarily in our bones. The next slide, this slide, is a summary of what we've learned in Biology 2401 and 2402. So this is a summary of the stuff that we learned before where calcium plays a role. So this would be a good review slide to keep in mind. Next slide. We already know the two main hormones that play a role in calcium homeostasis, PTH, and calcitonin. Next slide, I don't care for. This slide, I don't care for. This slide, I don't care for. I don't care for that one either, nor this one. Now this chart, I do care for. Only the top portion talking about hypercalcemia and hypocalcemia. Now make a note, that if your blood calcium levels rise too high, you can get a heart attack. You can get cardiac arrhythmias because of a high calcium level. So that is important to keep in mind. The top half of this chart. Next slide, don't care for. This slide, don't care for. Don't care for that. Now, when it comes to acids and bases on this slide, you should not know what a strong acid is and what a strong base is. Same is true for weak acids, weak bases. Next slide comes this chart. Now, you've actually learned this chart in Biology 2401, so it's definitely worthwhile refreshing yourself on this slide. Next slide. Now, remember, when it comes to acid-base balance, there's only two things we primarily talk about the hydrogen ion and the bicarbonate ion. So this slide is part of the bicarbonate buffer system that we learned in the blood chapter, in the cardiovascular chapter, in the lung chapter. <clears throat> so the lung, the cardiovascular, and the blood talked about the bicarbonate buffer system. Next slide. 
we already know that our blood pH on average is 7.4. Next slide. We know that we need to maintain our blood calcium, sorry, our blood pH levels properly. So our blood pH levels have to be maintained around 7.4. We have acidosis and we have alkalosis. So our blood pH is something to keep in mind. Acidosis, alkalosis. So this slide is important. Now before I move to the next slide, keep in mind that we have two kinds of acidosis. Respiratory acidosis and metabolic acidosis. Same is true for alkalosis. We have respiratory alkalosis and metabolic alkalosis. Next slide. Now, acidosis, alkalosis affects the nervous system and the cardiovascular system particularly. That's why maintaining your blood supply, maintaining your blood volume, maintaining your blood pressure, and maintaining your blood pH are vital because it affects the brain and the cardiovascular system. Next slide. Now, there are three kinds of acids. Fixed acids, organic acids, volatile acids. Make sure you know and are able to define each. So make sure you know and able to define each. Next slide. Now, you came across this one already, carbonic anhydrase. You came across this on page 847 of the lung chapter. So you know that this is an, a crucial enzyme as part of the bicarbonate buffer system. Next slide. We've already talked about this. Remember, we are going to monitor our CO2 because that affects our blood pH. Next slide. I don't want to go over this slide because this slide is primarily something mentioned on page 847. Next slide. This picture and the next one, this one and this one are a rehash simply shown a different way as page 847. Next slide. Why is it important to maintain and how is it important to maintain the acid balance? Well, we maintain acid balance by gaining and losing hydrogen ions or by gaining and losing bicarbonate ions. So there's only two things, hydrogen ions, bicarbonate ions, their balance is important. Next slide. This slide shows you the way we get hydrogen ions in, either through metabolic activities or by the digestive tract. That's how the hydrogen ions come in from the foods we eat. Likewise, how do I get rid of hydrogen ions? Either by way of lungs, similar to page 847, or by way of kidneys, because what we do is we take it from our blood and put it into the filtrate. Next slide. Buffers. Next slide. Buffer system. This is basically talking about the bicarbonate buffer system. Now the slide that's very important is this one. This is a very important slide. This slide is one that we have all three buffer systems mentioned. We have the phosphate buffer system, the protein buffer system, and the carbonic acid buffer system, the one we typically talk about. Now here's your protein buffer system. Make sure you know how the protein buffer system works. Now the best way to do that is through this picture. This is how you regulate your amino acids and how amino acids play a role in the protein buffer system. So if we have a, an alkaline medium, the amino acids act as an acid and releases hydrogen ions. In an acidic medium, the amino acid acts as a base and absorbs hydrogen ions. Okay. So that's how you're regulating. So if the pH falls, you add. If the pH rises, you remove the hydrogen ion. Next slide. 
Now the picture that I keep talking about on page 847 is now shown again. So from page 847, from the respiratory chapter, you saw how the bicarbonate buffer system works to neutralize the plasma's blood's pH through respiration. Here's the other picture you saw from that chapter. Next slide. Okay. Next slide. Next slide. And now we're on this one. Now this slide is one where it's the same thing as you previously saw, but it's done in a different way. So it's the same information shown to you differently. Again, the bicarbonate buffer system here. Are we using our carbonic anhydrase to make this reaction possible? Here's the other picture from page 1015. So this is from page 1015, and so is this one. So this is your bicarbonate buffer system. Next. 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 Okay. Now, this slide is important. This slide lets you know that there's only two ways that we can really handle it. Either get rid of the hydrogen ions by way of respiration or by way of the kidney in terms of we secreting the hydrogen ions out. Now when it comes to lungs, we're pretty much doing it by way of breathing it out. We're going to eliminate it by way of the bicarbonate buffer system and get rid of the hydrogen ions by letting it bind to something else. In terms of the kidney system, the renal system, we're actually going to either dump the hydrogen ions into the filtrate, making the blood more basic. So by removing the hydrogen ions from blood and dumping them into the filtrate, we're going to make the filtrate more acidic, whereas the blood becomes more basic. Next slide. Next slide. All of these slides I've intentionally passed up are related to page 847's picture. So this right here, for example, and the one right after it, these two are related to your respiratory story. They're re referring to your respiratory story. Next, we have renal compensation. And I've already mentioned that to you. We can either secrete or reabsorb between the blood and the filtrate. Now, this we've already learned, especially DCT and collecting system. Those two play a role in the secretion of hydrogen ions so that we can get rid of the hydrogen ions between the blood and the filtrate. Next slide. Next slide. This picture we actually saw in the kidney chapter, where we have three different mechanisms so that we can buffer the blood versus the filtrate. Next slide. Again, here too, if our blood is becoming too acidic, we can actually secrete the hydrogen ions from the blood into the filtrate or we can reabsorb the sodium bicarbonate and neutralize it by getting the filtrates bicarbonate back into blood. So remember it's always an exchange between hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. Now this slide is important because this slide lets you know all the bad things that can happen because of acid base balance problems. Central nervous system, cardiovascular system, especially if you have problems with breathing or the kidney or the buffer system. So that big chunk, that bicarbonate buffer system, your lungs and your kidneys play a role to prevent these problems down here from occurring. Next slide. I don't really care for this, but be aware of the terms acute and compensated if you should ever see it. Next slide. 
Now, this is important because you need to know the difference between respiratory acidosis and alkalosis and metabolic acidosis and alkalosis. Now, to get you started on that, we have two pictures. Page 1019. On page 1019, you have this picture, and then you have the one right below it. It is very important to understand acidosis from the point of view of respiratory as well as the metabolic, and this is important. I will tell you many instructors like to give scenarios that relate to that. Now, this slide is important. Respiratory acidosis. Primarily because you're not breathing well enough. So if you're not breathing well enough, you're going to build up CO2. And as a result, you're going to get hypercapnia. You studied this in the respiratory chapter, you're going to see it again. Next slide. Here's a picture that goes with respiratory acidosis. It is found on page 1021. Now this slide on respiratory acidosis and the next one right below it, which is this one, this one is respiratory alkalosis. So we have acidosis and alkalosis on page 1021. Okay. So be aware of how I can fix this or how the body fixes respiratory acidosis and respiratory alkalosis. Okay. Now, likewise, we have metabolic acidosis. It is primarily because of these two down here. You're not getting rid of the hydrogen ions. Your kidneys are failing. and You're not able to get the hydrogen ions removed. Or you've lost too much bicarbonate by way of your kidneys. So your blood cannot get back to its normal pH. So we have two reasons for that. So here's reason number one for metabolic acidosis where you have a rise in the hydrogen ions. You're not able to get rid of hydrogen ions by way of your kidney. So they're collecting in your blood. Likewise, the other reason for metabolic acidosis is you have lost too much bicarbonate ions because your kidneys have failed and you're losing the bicarbonate ions that way. So both reasons, reason one, reason two on page 1021 leads to metabolic acidosis. Now the opposite is metabolic alkalosis. And that is because you have too much bicarbonate and you're not able to get rid of it or counter it. So you're not able to counteract the fact that you have too much bicarbonate in your blood. This is the key reason for it. Decreased hydrogen ions or too much bicarbonate ions. And you're not able to compensate for it. Now, the way to fix it. This slide is one that I desperately want you to know. Many instructors ask questions based upon this one chart. So if we had respiratory acidosis, respiratory acidosis is because you're not building up, uh, you're not breathing well. So you've, since you're not breathing well, you're building up CO2. You can either improve by breathing or by bronchodilation and improving your airflow through your lungs. Then we have metabolic acidosis where you have lost too much bicarbonate or you're not able to get rid of the hydrogen ions for some reason and you need to neutralize it by adding an IV of bicarbonate. Then we have respiratory alkalosis. You are hyperventilating. You are removing too much CO2 
And so all you do is simply let your breathing rate slow down and you'll be able to reaccomplish re accomplish that. Then we have metabolic alkalosis. Here, generally caused by prolonged vomiting associated with acid loss. Normally, you don't do much with it. But if it's way up there, you might need to add ammonium chloride to help neutralize the alkalosis. Don't care for that. Don't care for that. And now I'm on the last three slides. For the last three slides, I want you to be aware that they're all related to a breakdown in your previous chapters, in your previous systems. So if your respiratory chapter goes kaplunk on you as you age, you're going to have an increased risk of respiratory acidosis because you're not getting CO2 well out of your body. If you have a bone problem and you're not having enough calcium in your bones, that's another acid-base balance that's messed up. Then fluid balance, muscle mass, skeletal mass, ADH, so if your kidneys aren't working well as you age. Notice all of this deals with kidneys because the kidney is going to be one of the things that goes bye-bye as you age and you're going to have trouble with removing waste from your body. Now, that takes care of the last three slides. Now, to best understand this chapter, keep in mind that what we're doing in this chapter is taking all of the imbalanced stories that we mentioned before and summarizing them by way of pictures in chapter 27.